Well, uh, I think we're close enough. I, I think we can start. Why don't we? Kick it off. Kick it off. Well, this is a 20-minute Nurture Nature show. You are so welcome to be here. I am the Reverend Dr. Laura Kim Joyner. And I'm Meredith Garman, your co-hosts for today. We are on Zoom and Facebook Live, and in either place, you can leave your questions or comments. Yes, yeah, so that would be that'd be great if you do. The Nurture Nature show is fast moving. It talks about a current theme and it goes on the current news and multi-species and conservation news and then a pause and then a closing. And hopefully we're gonna be interactive. So give us your questions and your comments and teach us what you know about animals. And so today, well, why don't you get us started? Today we're talking about grief and mourning. Mm -hmm. There's a Wendell Berry poem, The Peace of Wild Things, in which he refers to them as not taxing their lives with forethought of grief. And maybe forethought of grief they don't have, but grief itself, when, it, when death comes, there are some grieving behaviors. It's just that they don't anticipate them so much. And these are times when the world and our country are grieving losses from the pandemic. 593,000 in the US have died from COVID-19. And oh my gosh. on average, each death leaves nine people grieving, which means more than 5 million people are going through a grief process. And that's why we're talking about grief today. And then on top of this, there's biodiversity loss, extinction, and climate change. It seems that loss is, is ever present before us. And so how can we come into the peace of wild things? How how, wh what is it that we can do about this? And that's why we're gonna look at other species and evolution and our biology and see if we can learn anything about this, this thing called grief and mourning and death that we all share. And I'm gonna start off, can you guess what species I'm gonna start off talking about? Um, parrots. Yes, of course it's parrots. So. I thought so. I thought so. So I have seen parrots grieve, uh, you know, working with captive parrots, when one mate dies, the, the surviving spouse or partner won't, won't eat for a couple of days. And then I just heard about a story when I was in Puerto Barrios, Guatemala, this a couple of weeks ago, where a woman went and she wanted a bird, a parrot could talk. So it was the endangered yellow-headed parrot that her neighbor had. And she wanted to buy that parrot because it could talk so well. So she bought that parrot but she didn't get the other bird, which, which was a red Lord Amazon. And so she brought that yellow head Amazon into her house. And what did it do? Oh, didn't eat, didn't talk. Neither it was did, so sad. It was so sad. And so was the red Lord Amazon. In he the missed other, its friend. Missed its friend, his, perhaps their mate. And so the woman had to go to the other house and purchase the red Lord Amazon and get them together. And they talked and they chattered. And perhaps life, their mate, even though they're different species. Oh, sure. Oh, okay. Oh, close sure. enough. Close enough. Yeah, close enough. Um, and so, so that I, you know, I've been able to experience this grief, and then sometimes grief is mixed up with humans and people, such as the the horrible fire at Foster Parrots last oh, month. Gosh. You know, the the so many parrots were lost, and the people who work with the parrots and knew the parrots were so grieved, and then the birds that survived also lost their friends, and then of course there's trauma on top of the grief. And so we share this with each other whenever we, we have a loss. And so what, what do you got to talk about? Well, I, as always, there's the question, uh, you, you may ask the question, are they actually grieving or are they behaving in ways that cause us to project an interpretation of grieving upon them? And as usual, I, you know, my answer to that is it doesn't really matter mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. what's, what's at stake here is I'm a human and I'm talking to other humans. I may be talking to a few dogs out there, but what I really want to do is connect to the humans out there. And what is our relationship with other species? That's what this show is about. How shall we relate to them? And we can only relate to them with the kinds of projections that we have. So we have to use our projections in understanding and relating and constructing their experience in our own imaginations. And I think science and biology can also help us because we share so much of the same neurological reflexes that maybe what our body's feeling grief is also what their body's feeling grief. And there's 
a lot of goes on during grief, you know, in the human body. And we, and we're pretty sure it's going on in other animals too. Like, like, you know, what are there studies that talk about that, you know, people who've lost a spouse are more likely to die in the last year. They suffer chronic inflammation, they depression, they're more likely to get a heart attack. What's happening in the biology of grief when a parent loses a mate or when we do? And no single one thing. A whole bunch of different things happen and it's different in every person. In fact, when I talk about this projecting and interpretation of grief, it's what we do to each other. We construct grief amongst ourselves and we construct grief as a reality among other species also. And so I'm going to imagine then, you know, in this construction that they may be having the same anxiety and stress hormones that we have when we lose somebody because there's alarm calls. We want, we want to know where, where's the person or the thing that we lost and, and the brain is upset and the nervous system is upset because something's happened, maybe something dangerous and, and we want to be with them and we don't know how to live without them. So it has devastation devastating impacts on on our bodies and so why is that why would we grieve in the first place what's the evolutionary use to that why do other animals well and we do it sad? and we do do it in so many different ways the you the grieving hormones you refer to well some grieving people don't have them and some grieving people do i mean on on mm -hmm. average, a grieving person has more, more of them than another, but there's so many different, different, there is no physiology that is the grieving physiology. The, the grieving people manifest in many different physiologies. And so I think what you're saying is, and I tell this to people who are, are, are grieving too, that everybody does it in their own way. And everybody the, does it in their own way. And that, and that we call these highly different things grieving is a matter of social convention. Well, let's talk about the different ways that other species grieve then. You know, I talked about the, you know, how, you know, what happens to us. We have memorial services, we have funerals, we get sad, we have stress hormones, and it takes a while to kind of rewire the brain to, to build a life without that person. And some people say in the process of grief, we, we learn what's important. We learn how to love more. We learn to have greater empathy. And of course, we have no idea what's going on in other species, but let's talk about the classic example of crows. What do you Ooh, know crows. of? Yeah, they, they're like the, and the jays and the magpies. It's, it's the one they often lift up that, oh, look, you know, a crow died and there's a murder of crows all around them and, and exhibiting. Wow, we know who the culprits are then, don't <laughs> murder, we? Murder of crows. And, and you know, the magpies will gather around a magpie that's been hit on the side of the road and even bring like grass and dried flowers and and lie that around like we've we've seen we know that elephants will partially bury and cover those that have died and i've even heard that elephants doing that with humans so yeah. there have been the... some reports of magpies doing this with the flowers but not all magpies do that it's important to keep in Either, mind that they're and not all humans will send flowers when somebody dies right yeah. there's just and magpies all grieve in their own way too Right. So, so they did some experiments with crows and, and the, the, the one study, you can talk about the experiment, the one study that, that really put it out for me is someone did a study about West Nile virus. It was a virus that went through almost 20 years ago and crows were nearly 100% fatal or like 95. It was really high. And so every family group lost crows. They, and they, they're, they're tightly bonded in, in family groups. And what they found is that they had a social community response to grieving is that crows and groups of crows wouldn't move around as much. They were more afraid of new things. They weren't trying new things. And that's a sign of fear, stress, and anxiety in many species of animals. And the author, the scientist says, well, you know, it looks like a grief response. They just kind of stopped and slowed down and reevaluated until they could make new family bonds and reunite the broken up families so that they would have a new family group to go from. And they thought that that was grief and crows. Maybe it is a, it is something that we could call, we could use that word for. Mm -hmm. um, and crows we know do pay attention to their dead. They're looking for clues that they can use. Uh, when a person shows up in an area of crows with a crow carcass, then the crows kind of assume that that's the person who is the predator who kills crows. And when that same person shows up without a carcass, the crows are very nervous around that person. So they've associated that person with the possibility of predation. Another case is when a crow is just 
a, a carcass or a taxidermy crow is placed in some spot. The crows react very strongly to that. There's a lot of calling about that, a lot of arousal and some aggression. Um, and then after that, that place becomes a more suspicious spot for them. They, they used to feed happily there and then they become skittish and hesitant to do any feeding in that space because they, they're now associating it with, uh, with death. So, so I've, I've heard that one reason, a beneficial reason for that community response, and we don't have to call it a funeral, but that community response around a loss of a crow is it teaches them what to be afraid of. They teach each other, be careful of that person, be careful of that car, be careful of that rotten carcass that's got poison in it, that, that it's, it's one reason why they come together to grieve. And I wonder what it is that humans learn when we come together to grieve in memorial services. Well, it may be built from some of the same need to learn what was dangerous uh -huh. um, and reinforce that learning and to teach it to young who might not have directly seen the, the dead body or the, or the death. Um, uh, and we may have, some theorists suggest that we saw corvids like ravens or crows reacting to their dead and we picked up the practice from seeing them do it. That's a theory. That, that, you know, how long ago did humans start burying their dead? Well, it was a hundred. Uh, we have evidence that a hundred thousand years ago, we mm -hmm. were burying our dead. We may have been doing it from before then, but we don't have evidence that goes back that far. Yeah. So, so we learn from, from animals about, you know, the, the great, the great loss that goes on, on with them. And so many animals show show grief. Can you think of any other examples? Well, elephants are the big famous example, well-known example. Elephants paying a lot of attention to their trunk to and their touching dead. and talking right. and murmuring and giraffes will stand over their dead infants and, and other beings oh. will will you know mourn their infants. You were just telling me about orca whales this morning. There was one orca whale that was a bit of an outlier in this regard, but she carried her her dead calf around for 17 days. Mm -hmm. And, and I know that dolphins will do that and beluga whales would do that. I mean, it, it's just, we see this all over. We see it with great apes, with chimpanzees carrying their dead infants along with them. And even what looks like mourning with adult female chimpanzees. They, they've been shown to clear the, clean the body, uh, use tools to clean the teeth of a dead and stand like, vid, we would call it standing vigil, but being overnight with the dead female chimpanzee that died by her daughter. So it sure looks a lot like what we do, doesn't it? There's a slowing down of the body and a taking mm -hmm. in. For us, certainly, um, it's about adjusting to a new reality. There was a loved one that isn't a part of your life anymore. And mm -hmm. it, you just have, your body has to slow down to make its adjustment to the new reality, uh, a reality that has a hole in it, the shape of the loved one. So what is it that, grief is good for? Well, it's it's a physiological response that, I, as I've, I've insisted, it's highly variable, mm -hmm. but it tends to slow us down mm -hmm. and allow us to process the fact that we are entering a new world uh, and a new story about who we are and what sort of world we live in. And although I never tell people this that are in the deep parts of grief that we, it helps teach us what's most important in our lives because we've lost so much. And so we, we learn to love and we learn to love greater. What a hard way to learn to love greater though. Right. You well, and people who care or work with the grieving don't don't say that to the grieving. Of no, course, they no. hear it. But what the way they report is, they hear it from the grieving over and over mm -hmm. the, that uh, that they came to see what was more important in life. Um, that healing isn't about getting back to normal. Healing is about transformation, uh, becoming a new thing. And so if you're in the process of it, and in our society, it's like we inherit it from generations past. Uh, may you have the chance to slow down and, and learn and be connected to love and beauty during this time, time of loss. And now let's talk about some, maybe some good news. It's our multi-species news for the moment. You want to say something about helicopters. Helicopters, uh, well, yeah, well, helicopters in Massachusetts have been dropping rabies medicine baits, uh, some 68 
thousand uh, doses of rabies bait dropped for the wildlife, raccoons and other wildlife mm -hmm. to help protect against rabies in uh, in Massachusetts. What a smart way! You don't. They're not going to really line up for a rabies clinic. You know, right. it's hard enough to get people to line up for the COVID shots. You just try to get a raccoon or skunk to go get their vaccine. Well, many people you know. have said we got to do something about those rabid Massachusettsans. Yeah. <laughs> the raccoon. So, um, and another study that came out today, uh, uh, this week was it was really about pug dogs, but it's all those short nosed dogs with with big eyes. And they did a study to see why it is humans like those kinds of dogs. Do you know why they like those kinds of dogs? Eye contact. Eye contact. I mean, I just spent the last couple of weeks with the pug, and I have to admit, you know, I'm not really for that kind of breeding that causes all kinds of, you know, respiratory problems in pugs, but it is a pretty amazing dog. They, the short nosed dogs that, you know, don't have the really long nose, their eyes are more set forward and they're more focused to meeting eye contact and what's in front of them. So we like those kinds of dogs. The dogs with the long noses are hunters and they're peripheral and they're not as likely to focus on the humans in front I've of them. I've never thought of that before, but you know, I, I grew up with Lassie. Lassie's one of those long snout dogs. Mm. Those collies have long snouts. And if you, Im if you remember any interactions you've had with collies, mm, they probably, you probably aren't remembering as much eye contact as if you also had as close a relationship to say a boxer. Um, also herding dogs, puppy dogs and playful dogs tend to make more, more eye contact. And, and so even there's a reason- it, Even if it's a puppy with a long snout? Yep. Yep. So it's in, puppies don't have terribly long snouts. No, but that's right. That's right. And, and they're really tuned, they're tuned into it. So that's our multi-species news. And we always do a little piece on conservation. And I'm going to tie this into grief. Uh, mm -hmm. when, I, when I was in Puerto Barrios, Guatemala, we were working with the yellowhead Amazon and the young rangers were protecting nests and they, this one woman, she, you can see it in our blog, she had to hide as a group of five poachers came up and, and then she ran and got helped and they came back and they confronted the poachers, they saved the nest and, and they walked them out and, and they said the reason why they caught these poachers and why they're there 24-7 is because they lost a nest two weeks ago. And that so struck them with that loss that it recommitted them to saving the remaining nest. So there's something that grief happens and there's some news. So this little community hard hit by the hurricanes has got four active nests and they're protecting the heck out of it. And, and also speaking about grief, Pedro Vitere was killed in Guatemala in February, protecting a yellow nape Amazon nest. And I was just there last week, a few days ago, really. And we held an annual luncheon to to honor him and his commitment and to be in grief together with his family. So I wanna share that news about what's going on in Guatemala where I was for two and a half weeks and ties it into grief. And with that news, maybe we need to pause for a moment. Let's just pause. Let me invite you to take a deep breath and bring your mind to a loss that is with you today that you're feeling uh, a recent loss, whatever it might be. Because what you've lost on what comes to you also is an indication of where your love is. Mm -hmm. And so as we hold loss, we are holding love. <sighs> and may that love grow greater and may it grow into commitment. It feels good to slow down a little bit. What do you think? Just a little. Just just a little bit. So we're done. We went through that. That's our 20-minute show. We'll be back next Thursday at 4 p.m. We haven't picked a topic yet. Maybe we'll do something different than grief. We'll, I don't know. We'll just stay tuned. Give us your ideas. We'll or start. it won't be different. It'll just be the all grief all the time channel. <laughs> yeah, the nurture, nurture your grief <laughs> channel. That's right. That's no, right. probably not. Probably not. So send us questions and comments. We'll have the video here and on our website. And do stay safe and well and connect a love and commitment. And until we meet again, remember, you are an animal. So act like one. Well, you can't help it. So help it. <laughs>